Iconic class presents the East and West Schism of Team 54. I would like to tell you a story. A story that involves a fight between the East Side and the West Side. No, not the story of Biggie vs Tupac, but the schism between the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Western Roman Catholic Church that happened in 1054 AD. With any good story, there is always a backstory. So I will give you this before I give you all the juicy details about the schism. Differences of geography, language, the West spoke Latin while the East spoke Greek, and the many power struggles all had contributed to the alienation between the East and the West for many centuries. It was increasingly driven on by a gradual development of papal authority. The Eastern Church thought that this was in contradiction with its own tradition and that of the early Church. The Roman Church also did not approve of what the Eastern Church did at the Council of Chalcedon. They wrote the 28th Canon, which stated that since the city of Constantinople was honoured with the privilege of having the Emperor and the Senate within its walls, its bishop should also have special prerogatives and be second in rank after the Bishop of Rome. There was also a minor schism called the Photian Schism. This was named after the controversial Photius. This schism happened between the years 863 and 867 AD. Photius said that the West had abandoned ancient tradition. His main complaint was that the Catholics had changed the Nicene Creed by adding the filioque clause. This amendment stated that the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father and the Son. But the main issue in the Photian Schism was whether Rome possessed monarchical power of jurisdiction over all churches, or whether Rome was the senior of five semi-independent patriarchs, as Photius and the Greeks thought, and therefore could not canonically interfere with the internal affairs of another patriarch. A couple of years before the schism of 1054, some problems arose in southern Italy, which was then under Byzantine rule in the 1040s. Norman warriors conquered that region and replaced Greek bishops with Latin ones. When Michael Serularius, the Patriarch of Constantinople, heard that the Normans were forbidding the Greek customs in southern Italy, he retaliated in 1052 by closing the Latin churches in Constantinople. To make Michael Solarius's actions of closing the Latin churches seem more legitimate, he put forth some accusations against the practices and the theology of the Latin churches. The Latins are heretical for a variety of reasons. They use unleavened bread in the Eucharist, making them no better than Jews. Unleavened bread is dead bread, no better than a rock a symbolic denial that Jesus has risen from the dead. Contrary to the usage of Christ, they fast on Sabbath during Lent and during the fast day, do not sing the Hallelujah. Fasting on Saturdays and Sundays is a denial of the reality of the risen Christ after his death. They added the filial clause, which says the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. This doctrine of the double procession is the mother of all heresies. The Eastern Church refuses to communicate with Latin clergy because they shave rather than wear beards. Wearing a beard has always been considered a necessity for Eastern clergy. And last but not least, they force celibacy on all the clergy. In response to the Patriarch of Constantinople's accusations and his closing of the Latin churches, Pope Leo IX sent three legates under the leadership of Cardinal Bishop Humbert to Constantinople with counter charges. These legates entered the Church of Holy Wisdom on July 16, 1054 
And as the clergy were preparing for the Mass in their customary way at the third hour of the morning, they placed the charter of excommunication upon the principal altar under the gaze of the people and the clergy who were present. These are some of the counter charges found in the excommunication. You are charged with simony because you have sold the gift of God. Michael has bought his office of patriarch and abuses the title. In the 11th century, simony was a very serious problem in the Latin church. Humbert presumed that the problem was equally severe in the Greek church, but in fact, it was not. Like Arians, you rebaptized those already baptized in the name of the Holy Trinity. The East baptized converts from other Christian churches when they seek admission to the Greek church. The Orthodox Church has always held that baptism should ideally be conferred by a priest within that community in a triple immersion. The charge of rebaptism of other Christians which the excommunication attributes to Arians, more properly should be directed against the Donatists, a 4th century church of North Africa. They demanded correct belief and worthiness in the minister for the sacrament to be valid. It seems Humbert has confused the groups. Like Nicolaitis, you allow and defend the carnal marriages of the ministers of the sacred altar. I defend the celibacy of the clergy not as a matter of discipline, but of faith. Any priestly marriage is equivalent to having a concubine, and the sacraments administered by married priests are invalid. Like the Manichaeans among others, they state that the leavened bread has a living soul. Like the Nazarenes, they preserve the carnal cleanness of the Jews to such an extent that they refuse to communicate with pregnant or menstruating women. They grow their hair on their heads and grow beards, and will not receive in communion those who tonsure their hair and shave their beards according to the decreed practice of the Roman Church. They also neglect to baptize their children before the eighth day after birth. They refuse to allow women to communicate during their menstrual period and immediately after childbirth. It was a tradition in the Greek church to demand ritual purity of those who would communicate. This was based on the Hebrew scriptures that defined what made a woman impure, not morally, but on issues of worship. For these errors and many others committed by them, Michael himself, though admonished by the letters of our Lord Pope Leo, refused to repent. Furthermore, he denied us his presence in conversation, forbid churches to celebrate Mass, closed the churches of the Latins, and had persecuted the Latins everywhere in word and deed. By the authority of the Apostolic See, whose embassy we are performing, we thus subscribe to the following anathema which the Most Reverend Pope has proclaimed upon Michael and his followers unless they should repent. Whoever has stubbornly opposed the faith of the Roman Church and its sacrifice, let them be anathema maranatha, nor let them be considered a Catholic Christian, but a prosimite heretic. Let it be done, let it be done. After the excommunication was given, the legates departed from Constantinople. Michael, in retaliation, issued a counter-excommunication of all the papal legates and their supporters. However, Pope Leo IX had died a few months before and did not know that the excommunication had been consummated. The schism between the East and the West churches still remains unhealed, although many attempts have been made for reconciliation.